Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 29 of the live stream Final Fantasy podcast for June 2018. I am a forum user, Tenyo, and today I am joined by Chip Noir. Cool, Bo. Force Dealer. Hello. And Trace, a.k.a. the Twilight Mexican, a.k.a. Squall of CD. <laughs> All right. So to start off, there were some interviews with Tetsu Nomura lately, post E3, where he talks about the process of getting approval for Disney World and working with the staff of Pixar movies, or like getting approval for Pixar movies such as Monsters, Inc. and Toy Story, and working with the staff of like Frozen and um, Tangled to have worlds for that in KH3, and also talking about early, early announcements. Chip, did you want to start us off with that? I think the thing that really everybody wants to talk about when it comes to Kingdom Hearts is, where are the Final Fantasy characters? <laughs> Recent interviews, he talked about how Kingdom Hearts 3 has such a huge cast and it's so deep into its own stories that he didn't really feel like they needed the Final Fantasy characters anymore. And it makes sense. When you look at where they were, they were in Traverse Town and they were in Hollow Bastion, which are basically your first world outside of the beginning areas. They're there to dump the plot, get the character, get the player acclimated to what's going on, and a little bit of here is some familiarity. But right now we're three games deep. How many spinoffs? We're, we're on like the seventh game now. Uh, <laughs> Something like they that. are so deep into it that it makes sense to push the Final Fantasy characters to the side and just focus on it. And the first kind of sign of this was we're not going to a beginner world first. It looks like we're going to Hercules world straight off from um, Dream Drop. Now, there's always been at least like one Final Fantasy character in the Colosseum, though. Like the first Kingdom Hearts game had Cloud. The second one had Zack. We're not having the Colosseum. We're actually getting into more of the movie part. Which is weird that how's that never happened, considering that movie seems to be in every game but for the story. <laughs> Yeah, we're at the point where we're actually getting into the whole movie part of the prophecy where Hades is trying to release the Titans to take over Olympus. There are parts that only just now I've realized were shown of Mount Olympus that were really early on. I thought they were originally tangled places, but they're heartless that match the Greek themes. Hmm. Oh, right. That's interesting. Yeah, there's like flying enemies with like uh, Greek Roman helmets flapping about in this uh, little stream area, and it's so lush and scenic. It didn't really click for me until we saw the uh, Rock Titan uh, demo that this is the same area that we've been seeing for a while now. I guess now the God of War has moved on from Greek mythology. They felt safe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they compete with Assassin's Creed. Oh yeah. It's all Greek to me, baby. <laughs> but yeah, I thought he had, I mean, I thought he did actually make a good point of how back when Kingdom Hearts started, having Final Fantasy characters interact was a big deal. But now there's a whole bunch of games where they do that, so it's so special anymore. Yeah, that is true. The next thing to kind of look at is uh, Seven. That's always a fun topic that's going to haunt Square till they die. Yeah, Nomura basically admits that they announced that way too early. It's like, well, you pretty much announce everything way too early. And he's complained about that before. It seems like he just has no control over that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's other stuff, I can't think off the top of my head. There's other stuff he's complained about having been announced before he would have announced. Kingdom Hearts 3. Mm hmm. Yeah, there was a whole issue of, um, hey, we, we need to lose a year to move this to an entirely different engine, and this shader thing that we've been bragging about, we can't do that anymore. Oh, well. Right. Yeah. And, I mean, it's true, the 7 remake would have gotten just exponentially harder to keep secret the longer it went, I guess. I don't know. I still think they had some push money from Sony. Well, yeah, probably. You know, because the thing, the thing about, like, remake... There had been so many rivers, rumors for so many years that even if a legit rumor like leak came out, people probably wouldn't believe it. 
<laughs> remember like just like how on TLS right before E3 2015 when it was announced and there's like all these rumors and people were and you know nobody believed it like yeah right, right. this happens every year someone always says this year it's being announced and it never is because it's never going to happen until it finally it did yeah but then that's the question like were the rumors in 2015 legit rumors or were they just people saying the same thing every year and they happened to be right that year <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly like did they actually know something or were they just doing the same thing even a broken clock can be right twice a day right yep i I think the puzzle pieces clicked for me because that was around the time, if I'm not mistaken, that Wada finally stepped down. And <laughs> he was kind of forced out, but okay. Well, he was kicked upstairs and then fired. <laughs> Either way, he was the biggest stumbling block against this remake because he had this whole mentality, and ironically, it's turning out to be true, that Final Fantasy VII remake would be really damaging. And it is. If it succeeds, it makes everything they've done up till now look bad. Because, hey, why couldn't you do something this good? If it's bad, it says that Square is just a shadow of its former self, and they can't do anything with a winning formula, and this terrified Wada for the longest time. Uh-huh. Didn't even uh, Katase, though, say that if they began working on a remake, that would be an acknowledgement that they weren't as good as they used to be or something to that effect it does sound familiar well he also said it would take 40 years so True. <laughs> what is katase now <laughs> questionable yeah i think that like, i remember like katase got a lot of or kitase kitase katase i've ever pronounced that kitase it's, it's probably like a combination kitase um because i remember he had a lot of flack for that and i don't think that he was being legitimately serious because people have a sense to take that so seriously like they actually think it's gonna take 40 years no well no but he's just being facetious well here's the thing is that technology is ever evolving and the last time they were talking about this was five six seven years they've been talking about it on and off ever since advent children really that's when people really got into their heads this is what seven could look like in modern gen and they have done everything they can to sidestep a lot of building issues. I think they are only just now feeling comfortable after 15 of handling something with a lot of assets in real time. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it, was, it all started with that PS3 tech demo. Yeah, that was, that was a terrible show. <laughs> yeah, everyone, suddenly everyone was like, oh man, this could, you know, you gotta make P- like Final Fantasy VII for the PS3. Because um, wasn't there like a PS2 tech demo for Final Fantasy VIII, and that I don't remember that getting people quite as excited. That was <sighs> when I was in like ninth grade, so the internet wasn't quite the beast that it is now. I suppose I didn't learn about that tech demo until like a year after it came out, even. So it's not like everything is up front. Square really kind of did it to themselves because going back to I want to say it was 2000, 2001. I still have a, a official U.S. PlayStation magazine from <laughs> when uh, The Spirits Within was coming out. They were going to do some kind of remake of 7, 8, and 9 because they could now make shit look so good. So that was, I don't know, I kind of think they did it to themselves. I didn't know about that. That was Sakaguchi talking. He was showing interest around the time of 10 about going back and redoing the games. But of course, he left, so nothing came of it, and they went the direction that they chose to. So they kind of mentioned it themselves in the magazine before even the PS3 tech demo. Correct, yeah. Or are they talking about the PEC tech demos? The one for 8 might have already been out by that point. I'm not sure. I don't remember any of the I I remember the the 6 one for PS1. And 64, actually. Oh, yes. Right. Square just has this massive disconnect with U.S. audiences. I don't know what it's like in Japan. I really don't. But we latch on to everything we can get our hands on. And they just kind of let us simmer in our own juices without, you know, correcting themselves until it's too late. Right. And, but they've seemed to be better about it more recently before all this stuff, but like both with Tabata's handling of 15 and, of course, uh, Yoshida with 14 seem to be much more on the bandwagon. 
I think it depends on the project manager. I mean, even in, um, among the Japanese,、um, Nomura is kind of notorious for not really being that forthcoming. <laughs> he likes to be very mysterious. Literally, one of the interviews that came out says that he prefers working over social interactions. So he's not exactly eager to be thrust into the limelight. He's literally squall. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't there like there? Yeah, there was um some interview back in February where somebody interviewed him about his cats. <laughs> where was that? I... Yeah, when you when you sent it to me before you sent it to us before recording this, I had never seen that before. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> yeah, me neither. Like I, because when I was researching, doing more, doing more research on this topic and trying to find everything I could, you know, all the various various. News websites that basically report the exact same story <laughs> once one does. Right. Nomura gets this bad reputation for be for whatever the hell happened with Versus, but his past information really says a different story. This is a guy that puts himself 100% into whatever he's doing at the time. He said it himself. He moves from Kingdom Hearts to Seven for cycles, and he puts 100% of himself into that. Back during Advent Children, he got sick from work. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, it was. There was some worries about that and delays because he literally worked himself into. I think it was pneumonia. It's, he is dedicated to his projects. It wasn't Yasunori Mitsuda sick for Epic Club. I didn't hear that either. That's terrible. This is a common thing in Japan. You will work on a project nonstop. You will put some chairs together at night and sleep on it. Wake up, maybe have a calorie made, and get back to work. It's kind of amazing and horrifying. I was just,、uh, for Mitsuda, it was like generally people kind of assumed that they probably just had differences with him and let him go in the middle of twelve and just said it was for health reasons. But it was legitimately for health reasons. I don't know, but I'm sure Nomura was actually. At the end of the day, there seems to be this barrier that the executives, the higher ups, are putting between the creators and us, and that's what's giving them the most problems. They're not like Nintendo, where it's just news every month. Here's what we're doing now. It's it's maddening. And when they do,、uh, when they do talk to us, it's it's like pie in the sky. You know, this is what we would like to do, kind of stuff, and and then we expect that to actually materialize. It, it's、uh, it's what happened to、uh, No Man's Sky, the development of that. I'm not familiar with that. What happens? Ah,、uh, well, they they the the main developer he promised a lot of things. He did, I don't think he realized he was promising them. I think he was just kind of saying, "Yeah, this is what's going to happen because I want it to happen." And then down the road, it never happened because they couldn't make it happen. <laughs> Peter Molyneux is infamous for that, like with Fable games. Oh yeah, I've heard that controversy. <laughs> <laughs>、um, but I was I was thinking of like again、yeah, the the thing in February for Famitsu. For Famitsu, I was just wondering if like maybe he. You know, when you say he doesn't, he doesn't really like social interaction much. Maybe he's just like me, where he just wants to go home and cuddle his cats after a long day of work. <laughs> I don't blame the guy. I mean, again, coming back to verses, Square is letting people drag his name through the mud every single time. Some sort of delay is made. It turns out to be nothing to do with him, and yet people want to jump on him immediately. That is true. I feel like he probably does get a lot more flack than he deserves. I mean, not that he's, not that he's like, I guess, perfect, but at the same time, let's not go overboard with the hate. Right. I mean, obviously, there's, there's, you can't deny that his, you know, the, the trail of games that have had issues. So I'm not, sh- I'm sure he's not completely innocent. But people pretend like he runs every single thing happening at Square Enix. I highly doubt that he does. Yeah. He's not that. He's 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 high. He may be high up the chain, but he's not that high up the chain. Right. I mean, he's not making you know call about when they release a trailer or anything. But he he's still he he could post to Twitter or something if he wanted to maintain a dialogue, and he、uh, doesn't. He could take notes from Yoshida mainly, but also Tabata to an extent. Yeah, those guys really nailed it, and the the the. the Keeping the fandom in the loop and making them feel like they're 
uh, almost part of the process at times, part of the creative process. Nomura, I, mean, I remember reading an interview once where he said in his younger days as a developer that an older, respected developer once told him that you either need to pay close attention to what the fans say or just create and develop and pretend they don't exist, basically. And you can pretty much guess which of the two uh, <laughs> he, he went with. And I, I feel like that's been to, to his detriment. I really do. Yeah. I, I think at the end of the day, the sad fact is Square Enix, for whatever reason, is terrified of overloading fans. They want to focus on what they have coming out this year and everything else is just got to stay there. They'll rely on the instant hype spike when they feel it's safe, which is absolute stupidity. We can walk and chew bubblegum at the same time, but there you go. (laughs) Well, moving on to our next topic, unless there's something that anyone needed to add that didn't get said yet. No, I think so. Okay. So our next topic that we have is that I have invited Trace Diaz, Diaz, sorry, Trace, a.k.a. the Twilight Mexican, a.k.a. Squall of CD. I think you're, are you still Squall of CD on, like, the front page of TLS? Yeah, I, I just kept that because it was recognizable, I guess. From his GameFAQs days. Yeah. Ha. I forgot <laughs> that GameFAQs exist. It's, it's for the best. Uh, actually, I mean, <laughs> I still use it for walkthroughs, actually, but the forums are a freaking nightmare. <laughs> Let's not start like a, we don't, we don't want to, we don't want to like talk shit and start shit. But, um, so, <laughs> um, for anyone listening who does not know, Trace has a very extensive lore archive of Final Fantasy XV on TLS. He probably knows more about this game than anyone else, and he knew more about this game than anyone else before he even started playing the game. Just tell everyone my shameful secrets, why don't you? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so, how about why don't you start us off? What drove you to start compiling all of these facts together? Well, it was mainly a initial dislike of Final Fantasy 15. Um, <laughs> it really was. I I was very disappointed. I had seen on YouTube uh, because I, I didn't play the game yet. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, you know, I was watching some playthroughs right after the game came out, and I was like, "Holy crap! This game is like eight hours long, and they're uh, what? The nights are getting longer. What? When did that happen? And stuff like that. And uh, and then I realized people were just playing, you know, a, a lot of the um, professional playthrough people, I guess, were just rushing through the game. So they weren't doing side quests or listening to a lot of the incidental dialogue or, you know, talking to NPCs and whatnot. And that's really where all of the world building and lore was in the game. Um So as I started to become aware of that, I was like, well, if I'm going to dislike this game, I want to do it on legitimate grounds. (laughs) So I wanted to know what was really there, all of it. And uh, that really took off when uh, there's a, we have a member on the site, uh, Cold Spirit. He had, I believe it's a he actually, I'm not even sure now that I think about it. But anyway, um, Cold Spirit had compiled uh, the a few of the cosmogony entries from the game that are just laying around the world, and uh, th- and I decided to scour YouTube videos to try to find the other cosmogony entries. From there, I just started writing down any lore-related material that I saw in videos and. And then I uh, started realizing how much of the lore was just in the random conversations that Noctis and Ignis and Prompto and Gladio are having as they're walking around. And I'm... The Imperials inevitably interrupt. <laughs> Imperials above us! I say, shut up, you were talking! <laughs> oh, that's so frustrating. But yeah, um, so uh, by the time I had 
recorded all of the initially obvious lure dialogue, I was like, well, crap, at this point I've picked out like three quarters of the entire script of the game, so I might as well keep going. And of course, they kept adding updates to the game, and so my work kept growing and and kind of behind. Now I've not really uh, done much in the past couple of months. I need to get back into it. I've just been very busy with my life, but uh, I'm going to get back into it. Uh, I'm going to do the script for episode Ignis, which of course was wonderful. I'm going to do the script for the multiplayer mode. Uh, I'm going to go back and do the uh, the Royal Edition stuff that that added in, and uh, it, it's going to be complete one of these days. <laughs> yeah, you better get back into that. We all put a lot of our hard-earned money into. <laughs> <laughs> she did. Thank you again. <laughs> yeah, for anyone who doesn't know, um, we all a lot of people, a bunch of people on TLS pulled their money together, and Lith and I, Lith. It, Lithium Katana 17. I was used to calling her Lith. I sometimes forget what her full screen name is. <laughs> um, we got him a PS4 and a couple of games. We got you the Luna console, too. Got it autographed by the Choker Bros because they were all at EXP Con last October. Magical experience. And presented them with a PS4. <laughs> so you could finally play 15, because no one on TLS could let this stand that you had never played it, yet you knew more about the game than we did. I was so touched. I, I cried, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> so as the one person in the room that's not played more than maybe 20 minutes of story, it sounds like there's a lot of important stuff that might be useful to come into the game already knowing. From your research, what would you say would be the most important thing to know about 15 starting absolutely cold that you might miss? Because I'm the kind of gamer that doesn't want to poke every single NPC in existence. Uh, I would say the most important thing is uh, to abandon that approach to the game. <laughs> because <laughs> you you will be lost, I swear, if you if you don't poke at all. And, and like I said, I initially really disliked the game because I thought there was so little to it. But, and, and you know, for some people, that maybe, maybe they're okay with that approach. So how would you say your opinion of the game is after all this meta-knowledge? Oh, I love it now. I really do. Uh, it's easily one of my favorites in the series at this point, just maybe because I've spent so much time with it. It may even be my favorite. Um, uh, it, it very well might be. More so than eight? <laughs> it's hard to say. It, it's possible. I mean, I've spent a lot of time with eight as well. So uh. He especially likes the ones that have problems telling their story. But... You know, uh, <laughs> Wow. <laughs> no, I <laughs> sorry, I was gonna dig on get a dig on that. But no That was clever. My question for you was that fast or feature of fifteen that you have to go hunting for all the story, even outside of the game, all over the place. Some people really criticize it. I I'm sort of ambivalent about it myself. But do you do you do you think that makes that made you like it more or less? Like so if Knowing everything you know about the game, would you like it more if it was all obviously told to you, or do you like it more because it wasn't? I think it would be fair to say that uh, having to piece it together caused me to like it more, just because I had to spend more time with it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do think it had a um, the the world building um, fairly simple as well. It has a a genuinely great villain um and that the the characters the main cast and their interactions and of course the voice acting are all top notch um but yeah i mean the, the story itself is, is is a fairly simple one and i i think that was by design um they really went back to the final fantasy roots in a lot of ways with the plot i think um mm -hmm. a lot of echoes of six and seven yeah, yeah, it, it it's. Um, I mean, even from the you know right at the get go, they they harken back to the uh, 
the intro to the original Final Fantasy. So they um, they, they kind of uh, telegraph what they were doing a little bit there. You know, I, I think had it been presented in a more uh, traditional way, it it might not have been as endearing to me as it became. It might have been a little too simplistic, you think? May have been, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the you know the character character interactions would still be fantastic, of course. But yeah, right. Like to to, to address Chip's question, I, I not generally a completionist. I didn't go hunting down everything. I usually did always. I did keep an eye out for every radio and listen to the radio broadcast because I liked that what's happening in the world outside of where you are. But what I didn't ever hunt down were those the or the name of those books the about all the gods the astrology yeah astrology yes that i would find them occasionally but i never knew where to look so everything about those i know i learned from your stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah i never like i guess i never really hunted down them but there were there's radios pretty much everywhere it almost especially when you go to the diners so i would always make sure to listen to those but yeah i really liked those yeah, I never, I never went out of my way to find the books, but whenever I saw one, I would read it. So it kind of sounds to me like you have the base game, and you can make it as deep as you want to, depending on your effort, and it really does reward the exploration. Yeah, because I would say that, yeah, because I think that you can get through the main story pretty quickly. I know you don't have to be a super high level to beat the game. I think I was somewhere in the 50s and I had no problem taking down. I think I was I think I was 49. Yeah. I was like 53 or something and our, and I felt like I was overleveled for beating the game. Oh yeah, you can easily overlevel. Yeah, so the end boss is really it's pretty low level when you think about considering the fact that it's the end of the game boss, but there's a lot of optional bosses that you have to be higher level for. Yeah, now there are even more than there were than there used to be. Yeah, they <laughs> added in a few more. What would you say is the most interesting tidbit of information you found in all of your lore archiving? The most interesting would be the stuff in honestly the other localizations of the game. Um, especially the German localization. Okay. There were a number of things that were not in the uh, localization initially, but they would show up in the German or the French, especially the German. And um, then they would, you know, maybe be mentioned later on down the road in a update to the, um, the, to the game. They, they would show up in the English localization but they were, you know, in some of these other um, versions from the start. And uh, that, that, to me, was a, a really interesting observation to, to discover. Um, other, other people pointed it out um, on uh, game FAQs and Reddit. And uh, so I started looking into that stuff. Um, sometimes even the Japanese uh, would be missing something that was in another uh, localization. That's now that's really strange. You'd think that the Japanese would be the most complete version of it. Would expect that. Absolutely. And so it really uh again, you know, going back to, you know, having to piece everything together, it, it became this really weird uh treasure hunt. Uh looking at, you know, what they were saying on other um you know, message boards and other languages and such, just tr trying to find out what other other people around the world were, were making of stuff. And you would get details that just weren't available in English unless you were determined to find them. <laughs> it was, it, it still is really bizarre to me um, that the, the German localization is the most complete to, to give a second answer to the to your question about what's the most interesting, uh, anything about Arden to me, um, he's easily the, my favorite Final Fantasy villain, and uh, any any tidbit about him, I I, I just crave it, and uh, so that's that's always a, a delight for me. I still haven't jumped onto the PS4 and 
so by proxy from fantasy 15 and i keep looking at it like I, i'm kind of glad i'm waiting because you don't seem to be finished will you ever be finished <laughs> <laughs> i'm missing these tied missions but at the same time you have all these updates as you're talking about and i just want a full game one time through yeah, I haven't even started playing the Royal Edition yet. I actually had to like delete some stuff off my PS4 because <laughs> it became too full. Oh yeah, it's like a hundred gigs now. Yeah. Yeah, I I think I joked once that they're gonna have to release a uh, a complete edition of Final Fantasy 15 that is its own one terabyte system because <laughs> that's. <laughs> That's where we're getting to. That'll be when I finally buy it. <laughs> buy a special PS4, the entire hard drive is nothing but Final Fantasy 15. <laughs> That's the direction we're going. And yes. that... <laughs> My favorite of your little localization tidbits was that what are demons in the English version and the Japanese version are called C, as in what failed the C become in the 13 series. It's an interesting holdover from its versus 13 days that they got rid of in the English version. Oh, that is pretty cool. Oh! Why would they change that? Because we don't like 13 here. <laughs> they didn't want it to people to remind people of 13, I guess. Probably, yeah. Uh, 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 Demon sounds cooler anyway. I mean, I guess. <laughs> but I did think it was very interesting. Uh, th those are always interesting details as well. Anything that uh, is a holdover from the Fabula Nova Crystallis days. Mm -hmm. Well, I I am probably going to look into these lore stuff. Um, where can we find them on our site? Uh, uh, really, if you just go to Google and type in uh, Final Fantasy 15 lore or the Livestream.net Final Fantasy 15 lore should pop up. I'm not sure what the URL actually is for the archive. Yeah, you can get to it under uh, on the homepage if you click Analysis. Right now, it's the second one down. Because uh, I remember the only reason I managed to get through 13 without tearing my hair out is that I spent so much time kind of doing what you did, looking at all the stuff that was translated over from Japanese, so I was already set to go when that game started. So having that knowledge for 15 might also help me too when I finally get into it. I will warn you that there, you know, the spoilers will be all over the place in that archive, though, if you check it out. And uh, I mean, that's up to you. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's right here. We will put a link to the lore archive in the comments for people to be able to reach it quickly. Cool. And and uh, should mention that as long as you can get to one uh, page from the archive, you'll be able to get to the rest of it because I tried to provide lots of navigation links on each individual article. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, I guess one final question to wrap this up. How would you say your experience changed? I don't know if we've quite covered this part yet in this discussion, but like from before you started playing the game to when you actually finally did, how did it feel to experience all this stuff that you'd only read about? Do you think it enhanced, enhanced your experience? Do you think it, do you wish you had played the game first or? You know, it's, it's hard to, uh, you know, imagine before the uh, genie came out of the bottle, you know, but um <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I have to say that it enhanced the experience. I mean, it it, it became something far different than it, it would have otherwise been. And, of course, the, you know, unforgettable way that I got the opportunity to play the game will always be influencing my feelings every time I turn it on. Every, every time it comes on, yeah, I'm... I'm back there when you guys gave me the game and the <laughs> system and it it's always uh you know my, my heart just warms up right right away so <laughs> that's, that's my answer to that <laughs> memories <laughs> if i hear even an awful cover of stand by me you know i want to cry so Aww. <laughs> i never actually thought about that song that much although it doesn't it's not 
I wondered if that would like show up all over the game, like why did in Crisis Core or something, but it doesn't really. It's in the beginning and the credit. <laughs> and then there's two other songs that Florence and Machine recorded that don't really show up much at all. I'm not even sure I knew that they did. <laughs> yeah, there's three songs that they recorded, and the only one you re- that ever is in the game is Stand By Me. I think that one of the other ones is in some side menu thing somewhere, but... The other Gak song, Dirge of Servers, that isn't Redemption. Longing. <laughs> yeah, so the... I know right now on the front page it says FF15 script and lore archive complete, but with all like the DLC stuff that's continuously coming out, would you call it complete <laughs> anymore? <laughs> oh, goodness. It, it was complete at the time. I posted that. <laughs> it's Square Enix complete. It's Square Enix complete. Because <laughs> there's still three more chapters, right? They're doing Luna, Arden, and Noctis. No, Aranea, not Noctis. Aranea. Oh, four more. Yeah. So all of those. Then. Dang, that's a lot. But we'll have a lot of fun. Yeah, it does seem like we have to light at the end of the tunnel. After this year, they're done. Well, it's next year. Next year. And then who will... Yeah, yeah they, are, they are all supposed to come out next year. I'm never going to get to play this game. <laughs> you will eventually. And then I wonder if that team will go on to 16 or it will be a totally different... That's a perfect segue into our next topic. I'm here to help. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um... And this is something that Chip was wanting to ask us and the audience. So, Chip, I will let you go ahead and ask away. So, through a combination of events, uh, Postmodern Jukebox got into my YouTube playlist. And it got me thinking about how Final Fantasy VII was originally going to be set in 1930s New York City, which is just a whole bag of possibilities. And it kind of got me thinking, we don't know anything about 16. We've gone all over the spectrum in terms of genres, but there's still a lot that they haven't explored in terms of themes, settings, eras. And I kind of want to ask the community, starting with you guys, where do you want Final Fantasy to go? Do you want to go fantasy? Do you want to go modern? Do you want to go into outer space? I've heard people talk about that. Uh, or, like, I want to see a noir Final Fantasy. What do you guys want to see? Um, I wouldn't mind going back to something a bit more, I guess, not real world. But, like, but I, I still kind of like maybe like some technology, but in a more fantastical medievalish type setting like a world kind of like how 12 was they still had technology but it was different than our technology and it was like powered by these crystals and stuff um not necessarily the same as 12 but kind of similar where so it's not like the real world and they can just they just use swords and magic instead but just a fantasy world that has some sci-fi incorporated in that kind of runs off of the magic if that makes sense well, yeah, there's two different ways that Final Fantasy has covered it. It's either been, like you said, or you have the formula that they started with one, where it starts off medieval high fantasy, and then suddenly in the 11th hour, there's all this science fiction shoved right in there. <laughs> so uh, there's that. Uh, what about you, Force? Yeah, I'm tra- yeah, I'm trying to think that is 8 and 15 are definitely the two that are, quote, modern. And then seven is sort of steampunky, anachronistic, not quite steampunk, cyberpunk, I don't know. But then the rest are all pretty much medieval with, like you say, some science fiction. The noir is an interesting idea. I wouldn't want it, I wouldn't want it in New York, so I wouldn't want it in a real city. But that would be a very, but that would be a very different atmosphere, that's for sure. That would be interesting, because that is something that hasn't been covered before. But yeah, and like, I guess 13 was full-on science fiction. That was really modern or fantasy. I was just science fiction. <laughs> yeah, 13 went in the opposite direction. It started out heavily sci-fi, and then you got into spiritualism and magic, and suddenly gods and everything towards the end. It, yeah. it flipped a lot of tropes in the reverse order, actually. Right, but yeah, I mean, I think it could probably to get all the nine fanboys to quit whining if they did a medieval <laughs> one. Not that, I'm not just saying nine. I, I, I love FF9, I just put everyone always says, like, why can't they just do nine again? But so I think that would be fine if they did that. I, I don't mind. It, it would be interesting 
Like, I don't mind the more action-y combat things, but I also like the turn-based. It would be interesting to see what they could do if they full-on high graphics but turn-based. They still haven't done that. Well, Square has been doing surveys again, which are like 20 minutes long, <laughs> and they actually have a lot of dialogue boxes asking us what we think directly. I'm sure many people have made their opinions loud and clear. You know, I don't think I've ever taken one of those surveys. I took the one for FF15. I haven't taken this one, but I don't envy the person who has to read. There's surely a lot of very angry letters. <laughs> <laughs> Hope they get paid a decent amount. <laughs> So, Tress, what about you? Themes, era, what are your thoughts? Oh, well, I, my favorite worlds, of course, are 8 and 15. So I generally like that, but um, I, I don't want them to... I, I can't say I want them to go in any particular direction, because I just uh, like seeing them do new things, different things, and maybe even revisit some things they haven't shown much love, um, like... Uh, Six's steampunky kind of stuff. Maybe some more of that would be nice. Um, yeah, it's hard to say. Uh, I they, they've never made a world I didn't like, I guess. So I just want them to keep doing what they do. Um, maybe a little faster than they've been doing it here lately. But <laughs> <laughs> I think we can all agree on that. <laughs> I thought one thing that was sort ten is sort of unique in that it's medieval, but Southeast Asia themed rather than European. Mm -hmm. So they could do that, but, you know, like make it medieval ish, but themed on some other region of the world. That's kind of where I really want to go with this. And so I really want to ask the community at large now what do you see? What do you want? Do you want to see them do something new? Do you want a new world to completely immerse yourself? Or do you want to see a return to form? So let us know. Ah, there you go. The question posed to the community. Tell us in the comments um, whether you can leave comments on the live stream forums or on um, YouTube or iTunes. Just let us know what kind of direction you'd want the world to, for the next Final Fantasy to go in. And thank you, Chip, for bringing up that question. That was a very good question. A great question. Next on the list, let's see, is let's do user comment all right and uh the last episode 28 was our e3 episode so we didn't get around to any user comments so we have a f not too many to go through i don't think so going from the forums we've got uh Tetsujin who goes the podcast is back i shall listen to this later yeah for everybody listening we're gonna try to get at least one podcast out a month we're gonna try to go for two but Hang in there with We're us. We're doing two for the month of June because the E3 one is kind of like a special side one. We talked about more than just Final Fantasy. What? Yeah. <laughs> Chatty has um that fucking origami. <laughs> yeah. In that um in episode twenty seven we were talking about Kupokan and at Kupokan there was Final Fantasy origami and Chani had a hard time with it. I'm sorry, Chani. I'm terrible at origami. Oh, boy. Next we got Tenio. You have to read my comment. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to do the origami. Sad face. No, I didn't, and I was very sad. I kind of, I wanted to try to sit down and do origami at Kupokan, and suddenly they were done with the origami, and I just, I was really sad. I was just on the inside. Next year, you'll get to fold with a vengeance. Don't worry, dear. There you go. <laughs> that was a great impression of Tenny, by the way. Thank you, thank you. I do birthday <laughs> parties and bat mitzvahs. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, Shadam uh, tells us this was a great listen to while at work. Very much happy. Very much thank you. Thank you, Shadam. Shadam, episode 27 was my first go at being the host. <laughs> Doing a great job so far. Yeah. Thank you. And lastly, we got Flair, who was with us at the time. Uh, listening to this now, still near the beginning, still, but I heard mention of the photo with me and Little Cloud, so she shows it to us in case anybody wants to see it. So go take a look at it there. <laughs> My face looks stupid, but look at Cloud. Yes, if you look back um, 
on our forums on the the thread the thread for the pot for episode 27 of the podcast claire gives a link to her and this little kid who is cosplaying cloud and he is so adorable everyone should go and look look at it yeah she was cosplaying jesse and she did a really great jesse but i know that little boy won like the the cosplay contest kids always have an unfair advantage at those things <laughs> i know right Anywho, she goes on to say, happy to hear the podcast is back. I was listening to old ones a few months ago. We still have all those up. Please listen to us. Mm -hmm. Upvote, like, subscribe. Uh, and I'd never listened to, and it got me very nostalgic about TLS. And I just want to go and add to that. We are very much a group-oriented uh, podcast. We have people from all over our community working with us. So look forward to hearing some of these people in the future, hopefully. Mm-hmm. All right, and we've got just a, we've got like just a couple comments on the YouTube channel for that. I'll just read those. Crash Ouch, who is also a TLS forum member, says, "Oh man, it's so nice to hear all your voices again. Heart, great work. Thank you, Crash. Heart back. Aww. we love you too, Crash." Then we got a comment from Ninkum Poop Scoop. Have you guys thought about going back and self-assisting the other? episodes of final of ff7 on the way to a smile to which i do believe lex replied using and the, like the live stream channel replied translations of all the episodes are available on our website and there are also audio books right here on our channel which is true check out the rest of our youtube channel it's a lot a lot of content there they are really good the audio books first the the case of shinra one is so good like i love it <laughs> uh, yeah just so you guys know, we've got a we've got a lot of projects coming up. Uh, we've got a Shinra broadcast radio play type thing coming up. We've got some of our articles, uh, the potential of Final Fantasy VII remake that is being turned into a miniseries. There's going to be a lot of content for you guys to look forward to in the future. So keep an eye out on that. Mm -hmm. And the final comment on the YouTube channel for episode 27 was: They announced the remake way too early. Yes, Hollow Cipher, we agree with you. <laughs> and so and so does Tetsuya Nomura. <laughs> <laughs> Please be excited. Please be excited. Yeah. Um, all right, we will go to the U YouTube comments for episode 28, our post-E3 discussion. All right, what do we have? Nathan Hopped. Personally, my issue with the SE conference was the fact that the speech given by the head of SE mentioned staying till the end for a special message, and nothing happened with an already painfully short showing. Uh, well, at least we got a final confirmed release date for KH3. Yes, that was a particularly trolly maneuver on his part. I mean, I don't know if he said a special message, but he definitely said, like, please make sure you stay to the end. Which nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> We talk about that extensively in episode 28, so go listen to that. I know he's a boss in Final Fantasy XV, and I'm going to look forward to kicking his butt in that game. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. All right. Crash Out, again, commented that it's nice to listen to all the raging against it. See? <laughs> More love. Oh, we love you too, Crash. We did We did some raging. We, we saved the SC top um, speech until the end of the podcast for our grand finale <laughs> for episode 28. We love you too, Crash. All they had to do was just never. I'm sure you all started. Not have a conference at all? Right. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> and just say seven won't be there. And everyone, we would have griped. Like, we would have grumbled, but it would have been fine. Yeah. I was, uh, Mr. Bushido says I was super wrong on FF7 remake being at E3. I thought it wouldn't be there, but it did seem like it was going to at the end. And I feel personally kind of guilty because I was one of the people that led the hype train. <laughs> there are all these signs. Way to go, I, Chip. I literally wrote the YouTube video for our channel. Crush dreams. All right. Well, the reason I thought Seven might not be there because I thought they were going to do a deep dive into Kingdom Hearts, but they didn't actually do that either. So I was still wrong, just in a different way. <laughs> Is that pun intentional there? Yeah. Devante Jefferson says, to say I was disappointed is an understatement. They showed absolutely nothing. They put all their cards in Kingdom Hearts 3, this E3, and that's not enough, but mostly where was the remake? We don't know. We actually have, a, there is a different video made, not a podcast, but where is the FF7 remake on our YouTube channel? Go check it out. And I am glad that Kingdom Hearts 3 got a, re got a release, if nothing else, because once it's out. Yes, get Nomura off of other projects, <laughs> get him on the remake. But yeah, then they'll stick him on, you know, something else. Without telling him first. 
<laughs> I honestly think he's going to leave Square after Kingdom Hearts and Seven are done. That's just kind of my theory. Wouldn't it be weird if he wound up in Mistwalker? Oh. <laughs> I don't think that would happen, but wouldn't it be interesting? Thomas heard the fourth remake Final Fantasy VII. I didn't expect much because, again, remember they had the start over since they got rid of Cyber Connect 2. This has also been discussed at length. We don't know the degree to which they started over after taking stuff back from them. Who knows? <laughs> now, who's Dan Tsukasa? I'm assuming that's the Reddit user. <laughs> uh, a couple of months ago, Dan Tsukasa came into a thread on the Final Fantasy VII Remake, claimed he... Subreddit? A subreddit? Yeah, he's Final Fantasy... Yeah. Um, he claimed a lot of insider information, half of which was easily debunked on the spot, and as soon as he got notoriety, he um, completely ghosted from the face of the internet. I was one of the first people to butt heads with him, and his name haunts my nightmares to this day. Is that the guy who afterward E3 was like, thank you for helping me with my, my thesis project or something? That was <laughs> S.E. Scooper. That guy went out of his way to drag me and a few people into a private chat and actually continue oh. to try to talk to us right up to the very end. And then the day after, yeah, ghosted. Uh, I am a mod on that Reddit, and I, we are going to be enforcing some rules about rumors from this point on. So go to that Reddit if you want actual news. We're, we're not going to take any more of that stuff anymore. Uh, and Thomas Hart also commented that it's that's true. Microsoft had a lot of games and world exclusive, but not all of them are Xbox exclusive. I don't think any of them are Xbox. Well, Halo, probably. And But everything on Xbox One is on PC now, right? See how that goes. And so, yeah, um, we definitely love comments. So you can leave us comments on the forum, on the front page of the site, on YouTube, on iTunes. I'm not sure. I haven't checked iTunes. Um, if there are any comments on iTunes, we'll get them to them next time. Um, so wrapping up the show, um, does anyone want to take a quick two minutes and kind of give us a rundown of anything nerdy, geeky you've been doing lately? Any games you've been playing, TV shows, movies you watched? So I have completely fallen in love with a modded version of Final Fantasy VII called New Threats. Um, I believe I brought it to you. <laughs> uh, it's on Kim forums. I... To this day, I, uh, listeners, tell me how to, how to pronounce Q-H-I-M-M, -M, because I don't know what that is. But essentially, it's a heart type mod that adds a bunch of really interesting features. Like, um, every character has an innate ability. Like, Tifa can revigorate from a KO once automatically. Barrett gets buffs based on his row and those stack, or Yuffie has troll level dodge abilities if she's ever hit. Materia is completely reconfigured, and enemies have really, really fun AI. It's much harder. You actually have to change your setups pretty constantly, and it's got a much smarter script. So if you guys have the Steam version and haven't checked out New Type, um, Give it a try. I actually want to get the creator onto the podcast in a future episode. That'd be cool. Nice. I, I really like it. All right. Uh, who wants to go next? Yeah, I've been playing. I s finally started playing the After Years, which I have because of complete FF4 on PSP, and I realized recently that I never actually got around to the After Years. So I'm not too far into it, but the the Moon phase is interesting, and I like that it's a sequel that's. 17 years later, instead of either two years later or hundreds of years later. Yeah, what is it with Square in two years? I don't know. It's always two years. <laughs> and so that's kind of neat about that everyone has moved on, but they're also not all long dead. But I remember, I've heard people complain that the after years is just four again, so, but I don't know. I will let you know. Yeah, keep us updated. Yeah, originally it was just a mobile game with reused assets, literally. So I've definitely looked into it. It is pretty much the same game again but if you really like four it's four <laughs> it is definitely four it, yeah <laughs> all right trace what have you been up to um well not a whole lot of geeky stuff because i haven't had the time but i have fallen in love with a this is completely not related to final fantasy a uh sci-fi show called the 100 mm -hmm. 
It is freaking amazing. Best show on television. It's in its uh, fifth season right now, and I am stoked for each new episode. I, I know of it. Isn't that on Netflix right now? It is on Netflix, uh, the first four seasons. Um, you can watch the new episodes from season five on uh, the CW's website. Very cool. As for me, I finally started playing Uncharted Lost Legacy. Pretty awesome. I am currently stuck on a fight, like a fist fight, with the main bad guy whose name I'm forgetting. But he keeps killing Chloe, and I'm like, no, you bastard, stop killing Chloe. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, can't, I can't beat him for some reason. I'm still in the middle of that game. Yeah. Um, so far, I, I love the game. I love, I think the Chloe and Nadine are pretty good together. Um, and I bought this game at, like, Black Friday, so I've had it for quite a long time, and I'm finally playing it. Um, in addition to that, on Netflix, I finally got around to finishing... Troll Hunters and catching up to Voltron and both of those shows are really amazing and better, like like way better than I would have I ever thought they were going to be. So yeah, no, Troll Hunters is done, but Voltron still has at least one more season coming out. I'm not quite sure. Maybe they'll keep going. Half my Twitter feed is Art of Lance at this point. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I I gave up a couple weeks ago. I've been watching an episode maybe once a week. I like it so far. He's an insane little acorn, but I like Lance. It's a pretty, yeah, it's a pretty good show. All right, so I think that wraps it up. Um, thank you guys. Say goodbye to the listeners. Bye, listeners. <laughs> Farewell. Que. Que. So everyone, thank you for listening on the Final Fantasy podcast, episode twenty-eight from the live stream. And take care, and always protect the crystals. Music featured on this podcast is courtesy of Incompetech.com.